should end on a, on a negative note, but I have to. Uh, every time we get new scientific facts, they're more pessimistic than the previous facts. I would like to see one scientific report coming to us saying, oh, it's not as bad, it's going better. Every time, the new news is worse. And so we have no time to lose. And if we can, you know, we have different constituencies. Some people are very much in this because uh, they want to protect nature. Others are in this because they know that for their businesses, they need a, a, a decent climate policy. But the constituency of security has not been really brought into this yet in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that is consistent. And I really salute the Biden administration for taking that initiative, for holding these meetings in the White House. For the first time, a U.S. administration is doing this. And for the first time, they're making a consistent analysis of these threats and uh, opting in the scientific community to help us understand these threats better. And I think in Europe, uh, we should do this. And this is very much the basis of the analysis Pepe and I have, have made. Excellent. Thank you. So, Secretary Kerry, you're the presidential envoy, special envoy uh, for climate. So you've been trying to do a whole of government um, interagency uh, approach uh, to climate, to security, uh, to U.S. policy. How's that going? How easy is it and how have you found ways of bringing all kinds of parts of government who think that climate is not really their business on board and getting them to, to implement policies? I was going to say, how do you think it's going? <laughs> we'll come to that later. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, uh, a profound thank you to the uh, Truman Marshall Fund, and what a privilege to be here with with uh, B B B President uh, Burrell and also with Jens Stoltenberg, who uh, I think has just been doing a superb job uh, pulling NATO together and and. Uh, setting an example of leadership. It's terrific. And this fellow is my longtime friend. We three amigos met in, uh, we met in Munich uh, at the Munich Security Conference this last year. And we all agreed in an early morning breakfast very quickly that we needed to do this, to come together to make certain people understood that climate crisis, it is a crisis, is not some you know, political strategy conjured up by people who want to mobilize people to do something. It is, if not the single one of two or three most serious security issues we face on this planet. I had the privilege of being in Rome on Monday morning and, and meeting with uh, the Holy Father, uh, Pope Francis, and, and his eloquence and his concern He's a man who just came out of an operation and, and uh, is in amazing recovery. But his concern was for humanity, as it always is, and our lack of willingness to acknowledge and act on the facts that we see and that we know are happening. And all around the world, and Franz just talked about it, it comes at us again and again, bigger and faster. The evidence could not be more powerful than what we have to get done. But there is too much business as usual, too much greed, too much unwillingness to uh, sort of embrace the realities of the future that we're looking at. And I mean a future where there are extraordinary economic opportunities. This is the biggest economic transformation we're looking at since the Industrial Revolution. And the opportunity through these new technologies to have people working it at uh, really interesting and cleaner and better paying jobs is right there staring us in the face. The transition happens because we build out new grids. We build, we put into place new uh, forms of energy provision, whether it's hydrogen or ammonia or uh, take shipping. We just talked about shipping. If it were a country, is the eighth largest emitter in the world. But they're now recognizing they've got to change. So there are countless ships. Maersk is stepping up and building some 18, 19 uh, methanol-capable ships. And ultimately, they're going to be building ships, all of them. Yara, MSC have all agreed to build carbon-neutral uh, ships. So how is it going? There's an amazing amount of energy which is going into these new technologies and this transformation, but not enough. Not at a scalable level, not yet the amount of money that's needed to invest that we know has to come according to the UN and others. So we have to kick ourselves into much higher gear, recognizing 
that the security connection of this could not be more significant. The security is everything, folks. I mean, your health security, energy security, food security, political and social structural security. If you have a global south that cannot live where they work and cannot work where they live, you're going to have people who are going to move and find another place. And if you think Syria upset the equilibrium of Europe with respect to uh, migration, wait till you see what happens when tens of millions of people have been left in a place where they literally cannot survive unless they move. Some of that movement is already happening today. Latin America, Africa, other places. We see it. We've just seen it with boat after boat that tips over and children are drowned and people who desperately want a better life are drowned. I mean, it's incomprehensible to me that people don't make this connection, but they don't yet. That's why we have embarked on this effort to make sure people understand. You don't have security, not any kind of security whatsoever, unless you deal with the climate crisis. And it will cost far more money by every economic analysis to try to do this late when it is too late. And we know from the best scientists in the world, we may already be at five tipping points. The coral reefs of the oceans, the Barents Sea, the permafrost, which releases unbelievable methane, and that methane is 20 to 80 times more destructive than CO2. And then, of course, the two big ones, Arctic and Antarctic. So if we're going to be serious and not join on silently to some unspoken suicide pact, we need to be smarter, more engaged, take action, and embrace this incredible cleaner, safer, healthier set of possibilities that are waiting on the other side of this transition. We lose 8 million, according to the World Health Organization, we lose 8 million people a year, they die, because of just the air quality. Air pollution is what it's called. Greenhouse gas air pollution. So it's time to get smart in terms of the definition of security and the way we do the things necessary to be secure. And it's time to set the, the planet on this unbelievably exciting set of possibilities that come with this economic transformation. Well, thank you for setting out all the threats, but also for a new kind of threat that has really energized and motivated the Europeans, which is FOMO. The fear of missing out that has come with the um, Inflation Reduction Act has uh, produced a, a flurry of uh, responses on the European side, which perhaps we can come on to uh, in terms of thinking about whether uh, yeah. these policies will be adequate to address uh, climate change. But I think it's, it's a very interesting what you said about clean tech opportunities. This is also uh, something that is an important part of the debate in explaining but, the system. Can I just say to you quickly? Mm -hmm. I know this is an issue, and we all hear about it, obviously. President Biden believes, as uh, Ursula von der Leyen has said publicly, that we don't have to be sort of competitive with each other here. We can work with each other and move forward because we all need to be deploying faster. China, let me say to all of you, China is deploying somewhere in the vicinity of 3,000 or so met, uh, gigawatts of power that's renewable. None of us all put together are close to that. So we need to be seizing the initiative here to work together. I believe we will work out kinks within the IRA. Uh, and by the way, Europe uh, has this amazing fund that you all were clever enough to put together, built on a trading system, which distributes a significant amount of money to each of your uh, nation state members, which can go directly into exactly the same thing that we're doing. So our, our plea is welcome aboard. Let's all do this together and move faster into this transition. And I know we'll work out. The president is uh, keenly focused on respecting our friendship, our alliance, and making sure we're working together to move in the same direction. Okay, thank you. So just coming back to foreign and security policy, High Representative, it would be great if you could give us some examples, some thoughts about regions of the world where foreign and security policies really need to adapt and change uh, in order to meet the climate security um, threat, but also the challenge of developing new kinds of relationships. Over to you. Well, thank you for reminding that uh, apart from foreign policy, 
I am also in charge of building security. And as uh, John has said, uh, the concept of security is, is shifting very quickly. There is new dimensions of security. Until now, security was related with uh, war. Uh, security against someone who wants to attack me. And I need to have tanks and canyons and tranches and bunkers. Well, security today is something much more complex. We are insecure for different reasons. And we are insecure due to the climate. And the figures are appalling. If you take the 20 more vulnerable countries in the world, and the less developed to face the climate change, the less prepared, 13 of them are in big conflict on the last five years. They are fighting. And when people are fighting, climate change is not the most important and prioritarian issue to take care of. And this fight, it's mainly due to the fact that uh, resources are scarce, and they are scarce due to climate, due to climate change. According with the United Nations, since 2008, every year, 20 million of people had to leave their houses due to climate accidents, due to droughts, due to floods, due to head waves. And the number is increasing. In 2008, Javier Solana produced a report saying climate change is a crisis multiplier. It's a threat multiplier. And that's true. It's completely true. And in order to face this, we have to be aware that we will have more instability, more geopolitical competition, less access to resources. I am coming from Egypt, and I can tell you that there the water issue and what's happening with the Ethiopian dam and what's happening with Nile Basis is the first and most important issues. And you have a look at two examples in order to be concrete. Let's talk about Sahel and the Arctic. Sahel because it's related with the topical image of migrants living because of the heating. No? They cannot work on their land. They, they, they live. Sahel is a typical example, certainly, where climate change creates conflicts and insecurity on a wider region, much, much, much bigger than Europe. And their climate change is crazy much, much quicker, 1.5 quicker, times quicker than here in Europe. And certainly, the conflict between farmers and herders will certainly make a lot of people living. They are already doing that. 1.1 million people in the last three years, 1.1 million people have left. And where are they going to go? Imagine. Not difficult to imagine. So the, what are we doing in front of that? We have to engage more with them. We have started deploying environmental advisors in all these countries, in all the, our missions, in order to try to identify the effects of the climate on migration and terrorism, because it's a vicious circle, you know. The more people lose their capacity to live, the more they look for other ways of living, which are mostly related with a machine gun creating militias and attacking the neighbor. And the terrorism is spreading from the Sahel to the Gulf of Guinea, and it's mostly related with the fact that temperatures make soil impossible to be work, and people have to live, not only in the Sahel. But in all our CSDP missions, we will have uh, climate advisors, and we will put that in front, for the front of our cooperation. Arctic people don't relate security, climate, and Arctic. They prefer the image of the migrant living from a desert. But look in the Arctic. Arctic is a new geopolitical frontier. It's an increasing role played by Russia, by India, and China. There are new lanes and new resources. Oil, gas, coal, minerals, and land. And new shipping routes. And this new shipping route will lead to competition and increased security problems because soon 
it's two weeks less to go from China to Europe through the usual route than going through the Arctic because you will be able to navigate through the Arctic. And Alaska will be much closer to China. <laughs> Geographically, it's the same distance, but this distance now can be navigated. And we have seen China sending Navy vessels to the region. And Russia is building a wide range of military assets in the Arctic. And we have to have a look at that, my dear friend. Because the Arctic is becoming the new geopolitical space. And we have to be sure that this renewed interest in the Arctic follows international rules and is not being pushed by the strategic view of this is a new place to move, a new place to have warships. And this is happening, and also new population. Because certainly for, for the Sahara, the climate change is a dead sentence. But for the Siberia, it's an opportunity because it will be much more easy to live there. So we have to very, be very much aware of these different geographical places where the climate has an effect that affects our security through different ways and means. Let's start here. Thank you. Uh, this Arctic uh, issue is actually a fantastic example of how much climate um, changes the nature of security issues. As I understand it, there is no NATO member, including the United States, that has an icebreaker, for example, whereas Russia has them, China, um, I think even Korea is building one. So um, it, it changes not only the nature of the threats, but also the kinds of responses that are needed. But all of this can sound really quite abstract to citizens um, who are concerned about the cost of living, they're concerned about immediate threats, like the, the war that's going on. They're concerned also about just um, how they deal with, with things right now. Um, and it's, it's tricky often to explain why investments in this whole transition are needed. Um, uh, as one of the Gilets jaunes protesters put it uh, in the, the pro protest in France against uh, rising <coughs> fuel prices, you know, the elites, they worry about the end of the world, we worry about the end of the month. So how do we embed these threats and these challenges into security policies in ways that citizens can actually feel the difference in their daily lives, can understand why this is necessary for them, uh, given the immediate challenges, and just not having had to deal with this before? Perhaps you'd like to start, Fred. Well, first of all, I don't think there are many citizens that need to be convinced that we're in the climate crisis anymore. I think, I think this is felt all across the world. If I give you one example, my recent visit to India, the attitude the Indian government took towards me was completely different than two years earlier. Uh, two years earlier is, you've had your time, our time is still coming, don't talk to us about mitigating our emissions. That's changed because they're faced with so many uh, erratic weather events. Monsoon coming two months uh, earlier, um, floods, droughts. Um, they're extremely worried about the Himalayas and disappearance of gletsches and what that means for their water. All of that has come to the fore in the last couple of years. We should have seen these signs coming many, many years ago, but here we are. And I, so I don't think, if we, if we are able to link, um, uh, to avoid our citizens falling into despair, and I'm, I think we're very close to despair right now, closer than uh, feels comfortable, and to show to them that we actually have answers, and these answers are affordable uh, because we can mobilize a lot of, private funding as well. And another step, convince them that not looking for the answers is going to be much more expensive and much more difficult if we don't do it now. Uh, then I think we have a, a chance of getting public support for this. The one thing, you know, I don't want to sound too Marxist, but nostalgia has become the opium of the people. Um, and so it's very easy in Europe to uh, offer a political platform based on nostalgia, saying, well, you know, uh, ethno-nationalism will save us, will take you back to the past, uh, you know, make America great again, and then nobody tells you which America was so great. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, all these things play into this because it gives, it, it gives people a, um, an option to not look at the future. And, and we need, and, and people don't want to look at the future if they're despairing, if they don't think the future has anything on offer for them. So we need to be able to show that this can be a successful policy. And we also need to have, you know, early successes in all of this. You know, the, the fact, if I look at a country like Poland, 
uh, the fact that so many private citizens decided to install solar panels has had a huge positive effect on how they see attacking uh, the climate crisis. And this is happening in many, many, many countries. So we need to look for rays of light. We need to look for optimistic uh, developments. And then that has to be part of a long-term framework. That what, that's what we're doing with the European Green Deal. And that's what uh, uh, the um, uh, well-named Inflation Reduction Act is doing in the U.S., um, and it's galvanizing public support, and it's galvanizing private investment. And without private investment, we're never going to get there. So, John, is there a way that there could, you could build bipartisan support for climate action based on security as the guiding concept? Uh, you've talked a lot about the need for carrots, the need for the private sector to take the lead, the, the need to build the business case uh, for climate action. But are there ways also of persuading uh, both parties in Congress that this is good for the American way of life? It doesn't just move, move away from a fossil fuel driven uh, prosperity, uh, which is very familiar to most Americans. Um, how would you see the narrative changing in the US? Well, I'm not sure that uh, I do see it changing yet sufficiently fast. Um, the tools of the politician and the diplomat are are the policies we can frame with our words and offer people. I think we have offered people a very reasonable path with respect to dealing with the climate crisis, uh, and no action is not reasonable. Uh, there was not one vote in the other party for the IRA. Not one. Nor have we seen the other party yet standing up and articulating the challenge of this crisis of climate. So I'm not going to sit here and pretend that you know, any one person has, I, I'm not sure what the formula is going to be. I don't know if you look out there and you see Lake Powell and Lake Mead that feed the Hoover Dam, which for the first time since 1937 couldn't produce electricity last year, does that not motivate you? When you see Houston yesterday, I think it was 41 or something, it was centigrade, I mean, just massive temperature increases. Not, not this heat dome over the U.S. right now, they don't quite see it going away very soon. And it's going to have profound implications. Um, so our hope is we do not want this issue politicized. We have bent over backwards. And we've done the same with China as we work with China to try to bring China on board. We can, none of us, solve this problem without China being at the table and helping. They are 30% of all the emissions of the world. We are 10, and I'm proud to say going down, and we will meet our 50% target. I have no question about that, as will Europe, by the way. But we have others that have got to join it because one or two of those nations wipe out all the gains of the others if they're not reducing emissions fast enough. So we're not doing, you know, we're not pointing fingers. We're not trying to engage in a, in a tit for tat or anything. Nothing to do with politics. Everything we are doing right now is based on mathematics, physics, a little bit of chemistry, and biology. That's what it's all about. And make no mistake, folks, this is not a rocket science challenge to try to figure out what's going on. There's one thing doing this. Unabated emissions. Emissions of fossil fuel because of the way we decide to still drive cars, the way we decide to heat our homes, light our buildings, power. Power transportation are two of the biggest elements of what is happening, and heavy industry relies on that. So if we don't capture the emissions, we don't win the battle or end the emissions, not capture them, end them. Those are the options. And unfortunately, uh, you know, we don't have the bipartisan majority yet that will move in the direction. We have to move so much faster than we're moving now. You know, when, when World War II ended, we learned that one of the key elements of ending it really took place in the two or three years leading up to 1945. And Professor Paul Kennedy at Yale has written a book called The Engineers of Victory. And he wrote about the mid-level and other decisions that were made to gain superiority in the air, to gain superiority of the seas, to be able to break through the fortress along the coast of France and here and other places. And, we, and, and that happened. 
didn't happen because we didn't take on the fight. That, at the end of the, of the war, we learned that we were turning out one B-24 bomber every hour. We were deploying three Liberty ships every two days. Are we doing the same with solar panels? Are we doing the same with... with yeah, I know. That's exactly the... the so, so I hope that uh, we will end any partisan talk and, and come together around the most reasonable uh, set of choices you could have in public life. Just one, one sentence, because the issue here is that both in the U.S. and Europe, there are attempts to draw the climate crisis into the cultural wars. And if this becomes part of the cultural wars, it will paralyze us all. So we have a collective responsibility to insist on the fact that this transcends political differences. This is about our survival. It should not be part of the cultural wars. Yeah, it's a huge risk that, of the green wedge that uh, climate becomes a political football, replacing in some respects, for example, migration, which you've all mentioned, as one of the key wedge issues between parties. Um, so how to keep the member states together? Is the security framing helpful in ensuring that the 27 EU member states think about the foreign and security policy implications and they're not just driven by domestic politics and also by the resistance of a lot of citizens in Europe who are concerned about what the transition means for them and who, who are seeking guarantees of their financial security, what's going to happen to my job and so on. How would you see um, using the security framing as a means of keeping the member states on track? Hmm. Well, it's not so easy, and certainly it's not the security issue which is more present on the, on the debate. When people talk about uh, migration, they consider their security, our security. They don't take into consideration the security that these people have been facing and the insecurity that has pushed them to live. So we have to start thinking about the concept of our climate refugee, people who is escaping the consequences of the climate change. They are not coming here because uh, they are not pursued politically, but because there is a threat that threatens their lives. Are we prepared culturally to understand that? Mm, I doubt it. But uh, what is important since we are talking about climate and security to make permanently the link because on the insecurity that climate change is creating. On the places where people are more vulnerable. And we cannot understand the situation of, uh, I put again the example of the Sahel, but I can't talk about the Corn of Africa, without understanding that it's climate change which is creating this move of the people. And here in Europe also people will move from the south to the north, because the south is becoming hotter. And we are used to the Europeans going to the south to take bad sun. Maybe it's too much now. <laughs> and people will start thinking that there are fresher in the north. So we are moving also inside, but in a framework of a relative comfort. We can go to the south or to the north, but thanks God our living conditions continue being good. The problem with the insecurity issue is that it brings to war. It brings to war. That's what I want to, to, to bring to your attention. It's not that you are uncomfortable. It's that you have to go to fight in order to survive. To survive with the neighbor who has a camel and you don't want his camel to eat the grass and there is no more grass. To, to fight for water among countries and build them and take the water for them and, and downstream people say hey look this water belongs to me so either you stop uh, keeping the dam for you or we'll attack the dam talking about attacking dams no? not only in Ukraine and this kind of insecurity is widespreading in countries which are much more vulnerable than us and they don't feel responsible for climate change I'm sure Frank knows a lot about it and immediately comes the, the, the issue of uh, uh, lost and damages and who caused it and in Latin America people tell you look 
Latin America as a whole, I am not wrong, it's responsible for the 3% of the cumulated emissions. 3% of the cumulated emissions. We are not responsible for anything. While you, uh, we are much better. So um, the, the effort, the economic effort to finance adaptation has to be considered as urgent as to produce uh, liberty ships during the World War. And on that, at least that we can say that we Europeans, we have done our part. Because of the 100,000 billion that we promised to the developing world, uh, Europe has, as far as I know, has been contributing with uh, more than 25, between 25 and 30 billion, which is our share, take into account our GDP. And this has to be considered as an, some, an expenditure that has to be as a war effort. When we talk about war economy, and with the Ukrainian war makes us to think on war. This is not a war fighting each other with arms, but it's a, uh, some, some people do that. Some people fight against each other due to the effects of the climate. And we have to come quicker. In a peacekeeper today cannot be understood without taking into account the root causes of the conflict. And the root causes of the conflict is not because these guys are bad guys. It's because climate change pushes. And, you know, the other day it was with, a, with a, an African minister who, who told me, it's not that we don't share the same values. We share the same values. Stop talking to me about values. We share the same values. What we don't share is the same priorities. And this is the question, the priority, we have to make them understand and us understand with respect to them that this is a matter of priority too. This is a matter of priority too. Hmm? Yeah. Thank you very much. I'd like to open it up to the floor, so think about your question to ask. Um, but before, just before we do that, I just want to ask one last question. Um, so... Yes, you talked a lot about the uh, temperature rise in particular and the way that climate is, is driving um, many challenges for the military. It's also a conflict driver. It raises new kinds of conflicts. And I just would like to know um, what you think about the role of environmental degradation in this. We talk about climate change, but of course, even if, say, carbon emissions stopped tomorrow... Um, even if we stopped the global temperature rise, we are already seeing collapse of biodiversity in places. We're seeing the loss of nature in ways that, that bring up new risks. How do you think about bringing that broader set of environmental risks into security planning? No, I think that's part of the, 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 the challenge and obviously part of the problem that uh, we don't only speak about uh, uh, rising temperatures, but also about uh, degradation of nature and, uh, and biodiversity more in uh, general. And that's partly caused by climate change, but also partly caused by other things. Uh, and, of course, that adds to climate change and environmental degradation as a crisis multiplier. <clears throat> but, to be honest, for me, we have more than enough proof that this is a problem. Uh, so, so we can have new reports and new science and new research, uh, research uh, documenting something we already know, that, that climate change is dangerous. So the problem is it's not that. Uh, a few years ago, it was actually, not so many years ago, there was an issue whether climate change was something to concern about, whether it was human uh, activity that caused climate change. Now I feel that uh, there's a quite broad consensus that, that this is the problem. So now the issue is not to describe the problem and to document the problem. The, 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 the challenge is what do we do? Uh, and, and first of all, I, I would like to praise um, also both what John Kerry and, uh, and, uh, and the Biden administration has, has done and is doing in the United States. That's really great because they're investing a lot in new technology. And also the EU, both on, on, on what they do in, in promoting the development of, of new technology, but also uh, the, the way they price carbon emissions. Also in my, my, my previous uh, position as Prime Minister of Norway, we worked hard for uh, pricing carbon. I think that's the easiest, the best way of addressing this. Um, uh, and, and at that stage, I didn't dream about the carbon price, so I think it's 80 euros or something. 100. 100 euros, of course. 100 euros, that makes a huge difference. Uh, because then suddenly uh, it, it, it becomes commercial to, in, to invest in carbon capture, in hydrogen, in, 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 in solar panels, and all the other things. And that is what we need, because we have the technology. What we lack is volume and speed, because the timeline matters, 
and the, and, the, and, the, and the volume of how much of these renewables we are actually able to, uh, to, 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 to deliver. Um, um, so, and, and you mentioned the issue about uh, the, the ordinary people are uh, concerned about next month, we are concerned about uh, the, end the, of the, the end of the world. <laughs> well, so first of all, um, I, I think actually also a lot of ordinary people are concerned about the heat waves uh, and the obvious proof that climate change is taking place uh, 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 now. Second, we should, I think, try to have a more positive message. There are many problems, but, but there are also a lot of opportunities in the new in industries, in building all this uh, infrastructure, in, 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 in building the power plants which are green and climate friendly, that is the new source of the new and modern jobs uh, for, for uh, a lot of people. So, uh, yes, I am concerned it goes too slowly, but at the same time it's absolutely possible, uh, and if we mobilize the resources we have, uh, and I'm impressed what the US and EU has done so far, uh, then we will be able to do something that really makes a difference. Okay, thank you very much. So, over to you. I have to admit that GMF have provided an absolutely impossible thing, which is something called a throw box microphone, um, which relies on something extremely unreliable, which is both my capacity to, to pitch things and also your capacity to catch. Right. So, um, I'm actually going to rely on microphones that come to you. Um, ah, there is the box. But if you wish to try out the box, you're welcome. Um, so, I can't see you super well, but okay. So, we'll take um, the first question just next to the box there, or you could just give the microphone. To work? Oh, That's it. Work. There we go. Wow. Well done. Um, do I get to throw it back as well? Um, well? I think that was the idea, but I wouldn't recommend it. No, 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 fine. <laughs> uh, Henry Foy at the Financial Times. Um, a number of you have remarked, made remarks that I'm going to pull together into one question. Uh, Obviously, climate change is a global issue, and if one country doesn't deal with it and the others do, it means we all suffer, um, and the Arctic is a big problem. Would any of you like to uh, ha give me an answer as to how much you think the fight against climate change has been set back by the war in Ukraine and the inability now of the West to engage with Russia on climate change, which was one of the few areas where Moscow still did talk to Washington and, and Brussels and other capitals. And uh, how do we deal with that, given that this war could go on for a very long time, Russia could remain a pariah state for a very long time, but we must engage with them on climate change, especially in the Arctic. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take three questions in this round. So could you, the woman who's here in the middle of this row, there you go. Thank you very much. Uh, Manon Dufour from East Fiji. Thanks a lot for, I feel very privileged to be to witness this conversation. Uh, we've talked a lot about, I mean, you've talked a lot about the climate security impacts, like globally, and like you talked about food security and migration, the Sahel, the Arctic. I wonder to what extent you're also looking at kind of the internal cohesion, whether it's in the EU or the US, where clearly Southern Europe will be impacted very differently to Northern Europe. I'm sure it's very similar in the US, and to what extent this could actually lead to more challenges, security or, or else, for like unity, territorial integrity, really. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, and just here. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm happy to be reporting for Arab Emirates uh, TV, which will uh, help the, the COP uh, next uh, year. My question is about damage and uh, and damage. Do you think that uh, this COP will be? Uh, I mean, how much are you uh, optimistic for regarding this uh, issue, uh, uh, cost and damage? And how are your expectations, general expectation, with this COP, with in 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 Arab country and in a, a fuel producer country? Thank you. Okay. So, quick fire round on expectations for the COP, especially on loss and damage, differential impact of climate change across different countries, and uh, the first one, which is about the impact of the war um, on climate action. So, who'd like to pick one of those up? Go ahead. I, I can try to be brief on, on the war. So, first of all, uh, of course, wars are bad for many reasons. Uh, the most important reason is that people are killed, uh, and, uh, and it causes a lot of damage uh, and destruction. But then, of course, on top of that, it also makes it harder to, to, to move forward on a global agenda and, uh, and, and make countries working uh, together. Uh, so, of course, uh, one consequence of the war is that it's harder to, to then uh, uh, sit down and talk to Russia about uh, agreements on climate change. But that's, that's, in a way, it's a problem, but the main problem is that people are killed every day. 
Um, uh, then I think we shouldn't overstate or exacerbate or, or that over, overstate the, the consequences because Russia was not so very concerned about climate change uh, before the war. Uh, so I don't think the, uh, so I think people, maybe France and others can, can say something about that, but, but my impression is that they have not been very focused on, uh, on the climate change agenda uh, 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 so, uh, even before the war. The last thing is to say that, of course, one of the reasons why peace is so important and why NATO is really, really regard our most important task is to preserve peace and security is that if we have big conflicts between uh, big powers and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and less stability and, uh, and security, then, of course, we are less able to make agreements like the Paris Accord. Uh, and, of course, if we are not able to, for instance, engage with China because we are in some kind of worsened situation with them, that would be a big problem because we need to have China on board in addressing climate change. Thank you very much. About the war, because the other issues, I'm, I'm sure John and, and France can talk with much more capacity. As you said, war is, war is bad for everything, but it certainly is not good for a climate fight. It's a, the changes in priorities are absolute. So a war, the priority is to win the war. All other issues become later. First, it's true that before the war, Russia was not very much worried about climate. I heard some statements from Russian authorities saying, well, why, why should we worry? At the end, the climate change is good for us. Hmm? For us, for Russia, it's good. Our, our climate will become milder. So they were not very much engaged. Secondly, the war itself creates a lot of CO2 emissions because the warfare is not being thought uh, in order to save, uh, to save emissions. Third, uh, third uh, Russia is not selling its gas. They're not selling its gas to us, and they, they don't have anyone else to buy the gas because they don't have pipelines. So they're burning it. They're just burning it. And the satellite shows clearly how the gas fields continue working because you cannot put a tap in a gas field. The gas continues flowing and being burned. So big emissions of uh, methane to atmosphere, the gas that we don't use is being burned in a great proportion because there is not another alternative client to the European ones. Then the, the Nord Stream 2 explosion has created also a lot of emissions of methane. So the war is a very bad news for fighting against climate change. And in, as far as the war continues, I don't see any way of talking with Russia about climate. You know, we'll say, I have another priorities. The real issue is uh, to be able to talk with China at any moment, because China is burning as much as coal as the rest of the world together. And thanks God, by the time being, we can and we should continue talking with China about everything, including climate, but with Russia, I don't see the way of coming and knocking at the door of Kremlin saying, look, what about climate? So the other two questions were um, differential impact of climate and also expectations for the COP, at which you will both be representing. Russia. He'll do Europe. I'll do Russia. Oh, you want me to start? Well, I, I think, you know, the... Um, I am surprised by uh, both the uh, consensus on addressing Russia's aggression in Europe, pleasantly surprised. It's not just a consensus at the political level, there's a very, very strong societal consensus as well, and I think this is something we should be very, very uh, uh, grateful for, uh, and I think it will persist. Uh, secondly, I see the different challenges between North and South in terms of the effects of uh, the climate crisis. but. Don't underestimate. It's affecting everyone. You know, Finnish forests are now becoming CO2 emitters. Um, uh, and we all have these challenges across the European Union. But the worst challenges, obviously, are in the Mediterranean. I mean, the desertification, the risk of desertification of Spain and the persistence of very erratic weather patterns in Italy, why? Because the seas on both sides are heating up very quickly, is something we will have to face as Europeans. And solidarity will have to play a huge role in that. And I frankly don't doubt uh, that we will find that solidarity. I'm not worried about that. Um, if I can say uh, uh, something very briefly about COP, um, I'm actually um, uh, optimistic that we can have a successful COP this year. Um, I'm not 
of those who say we should exclude the oil and gas sector from uh, COP. I think we need them to understand that they need to change. And you can't get that into their heads if you don't have them at the table. And I think uh, Dr. Uh, Sultan al-Jabbar is well-placed to play that role together with us. So, you know, I, I, I still have... If we, if we, together with the United States, could achieve that there is a real step change in the attitude of global oil and gas at COP, then we would really have achieved a, a great success at COP. And I think uh, the Emirates and uh, Dr. Sultan can be instrumental in this. Uh, a final remark on Russia. The Russians are scared to death about climate change. They are, because it's destroying their oil and gas industry. The disappearance of permafrost is doing a lot of damage. And they're in two minds about this. There's this you know, Russia has uh, many faults, and uh, you will know me as a, a, as a critic of, of them, especially of, of Putin. But they have a very strong scientific community who are very clear about the challenges to them of the climate crisis. It's affecting their oil and gas industry. It's creating wildfires all across Russia. It's harming the agriculture in a horrible way. Uh, they are really, really worried about this. And in the Kremlin, they're in two minds about that. There's one faction that says we need to address this and we need to engage internationally. Sometimes they have the upper hand, like uh, also I believe that was the case in Glasgow, and uh, to, uh, we could talk to them then. But there's another faction that says it's all bogus, uh, it's all a way to weaken us. Uh, they want to hurt us with their climate nonsense. And Putin is listening to the second faction now, not to the first. So uh, having a dialogue with them now seems to me quite impossible. The only thing we need to do is to make sure that they don't win this war and that Ukraine comes out of this victorious. Obviously, uh, not having Russia at the table uh, is a problem, and it's costly. And, and um, prior, in 2021, as we went through 2021, prior to the war starting, um, I spoke at length with Putin about, with President Putin, about uh, Russia's participation. And, and also I talked to Lavrov, and they agreed to put a pretty competent uh, team together, young, aggressive, and capable folks. And we began a dialogue with them. We thought we had an ability to move particularly on methane and particularly on some of their technology in the oil fields and so forth. And then, of course, regrettably, that just got wiped away when the war started. And there's been no communication since then. Um, but I'd, look at, I, I'd ask you all to look at it this way. While we have to make sure we deliver to the Global South and that we have development money and that we're doing things that we need to do, Remember that 48 sub-Saharan African states equals 0.55 percent of all the emissions. But 20 countries that are the major economies of the world are almost 80 percent of all the emissions. 50 percent of those 20, which I'm happy to say involves Europe, the United States, Australia, Japan, Canada, UK, EU, are legitimately pursuing plans to keep 1.5 alive. The other half of that 20 are not yet there, but some are really trying hard and doing interesting things. China producing a huge amount of renewables, deploying those renewables. India having set a target of, of, of uh, 500 gigawatts of deployed renewable by 2030, and they're really pushing hard to make that happen. So really interesting things happening. Mexico, which is one of those 20, has come to the table. They've agreed to do more renewables. Vietnam has signed an agreement, and they're moving on renewables. So if we can continue this effort, um, I think we can bring a critical mass to the table. And obviously, whether or not the oil and gas industry is going to play different, that's up for grabs now. And what the UAE develop, delivers here is going to be the proof, you know, the, 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 the proof of the pudding, is whether or not they bring people to the table and change the dynamic. But it certainly has the potential that Franz just described to be a success and to be different from any other cop, because we've never had that participation. And we're about to meet in Paris for two days tomorrow and the next day with finance on the table. If we can come up with a new finance structure and mechanism, this could be such a different 
takeoff platform for the next seven years. And remember, we don't have to do this all by tomorrow or next week or even this year, as long as we're moving in the right direction to create momentum in these new technologies. I believe we're on the cusp of really doing that. And that's, I'm optimistic because I, I know what he, you all do too. You know what human ingenuity is capable of doing. Look at what we did when we had to have vaccines. Look at what we've done historically when we come together. There are so many different things we could put on the table now to make this happen faster, providing we get people to be serious about the nature of the threat. And, and that is still that question mark that is tied to attitudes, complacency, greed, indifference, uh, skepticism about the transition, fear of the transition, a lot of different feelings out there that we have to try to manage. But I am really hopeful we can, uh, you know, pull this off and get where we need to be. Thank you. We are out of time, but I would like to just finish with thinking a little bit forward on where we go. We've got COP28 happening shortly, as just discussed. There will be the EU um, joint communication on climate security at the end of this month. Uh, there will also be at the Vilnius summit uh, a NATO communique looking at climate again. So is this a one-off? having all four of you here together. Um, is this, uh, you know, the first and last time that we'll see such transatlantic unity on the need for action? Um, or are there ways of operationalizing this and embedding it, not only in security policies, but also in concrete action? Um, it would be very good just to have a quick view from the each of you. President and I are on getting on a train. We're going together. We're going to have a summit on the train to Paris. And we invite Jens to come along and we'll make everything change. <laughs> So apart from the conversations between the old buddies, <laughs> how about um, actually operationalizing this in the policies, in the ways in which um, the EU and NATO actually do their daily business? But, but in many ways, that's all that is going on. First of all, the United States is a NATO ally. So when Indeed. we do something in NATO, we do it with, together with the United States. And the United States is actually investing in and, and working hard to also develop technologies for the, for the armed forces that are green there. They are, they are now looking into how to, to develop Bradley uh, infantry fighting vehicles that are, that are not uh, based on fossil fuels, but actually electric. So, 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 so this is part of the efforts that NATO allies are doing, and the United States is part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, then NATO and the European Union, uh, well, we have established a, a, a task force where we work on uh, resilience and also the way to address the consequences of climate change uh, uh, is part of uh, that. And most NATO allies are, most EU members are also NATO allies. When, uh, when Sweden is a full member, then 96% of the people living in the European Union, they live in a NATO country. All we so, need now is for Norway to join. Yeah, the but that's where that... that uh, <laughs> <laughs> also, I... I, also, I, I your next job. Also, I, yeah, no. Uh, I've tried twice and lost. So, uh, so uh, that's too hard. Uh, also, I use my, my standard line on this, but I stopped uh, doing that for some years ago, is that Norway will become a member uh, of uh, EU long before Sweden becomes a member of... Uh, of or NATO, and I was totally wrong. So, <laughs> now it so, could be Ukraine. No, no. So we need to work with the uh, close, uh, close partners like Norway, and then uh, and then uh, and then Norway is a member of NATO, and then and then um, and then. Uh, so the work is in, in progress. Uh, so uh, hopefully we can meet again. But even more important than meetings like this is actually that we go back to our organisations and ensure our nations and ensure that we actually are delivering and things are happening. Yeah, Giuseppe, how how can this be operationalised? Just give us a couple of examples. Uh, we need more partnership among us. There is a lot of work to do, which is not very much sexy. We'll not make uh, any headline in the newspapers. But we need a lot of uh, research, capability development, resilience building, training of our soldiers, modernizing our warfare. There's a lot of work to do for our armies to become more green. Because certainly they are not, they are not conceived to be green. Uniforms are green. Uh, uniforms <laughs> or brown. <laughs> depends on the country. Or brown, no? But uh, it depends on the, on the, on the landscape and on the army. But certainly there is a big work to do that. And there are small things and big things. Small things. Allow me to put a lot of, uh, two examples. I am going to create in our satellite center in Madrid. We have a satellite center, a hub to analyze climate and security and a policy analysis related to that, taking the data that we can have 
through our satellites, and to make the link between security and climate. Second, in all our CSDP missions, we will uh, embed a climate package. We are all over the world. We are more than 5,000 people deployed around the world. And they have to have a climate package in order to understand and to follow what's going on and how we can support these countries where we are deployed to do, to do more. I know that it's not their priorities, I understand, but it's our priority and we have to make them to understand how to do. And certainly much more partnership because we are good partners, but on this specific field, everything is to be done. We haven't started yet. Thank you. Well, three, three years ago, we didn't even know that we, could, that we needed to develop policy on this. So, so it's, it's really new. The understanding that security is intimately linked with the climate crisis is relatively new. And what I would like, just to give one example, because we're, we're out of time. If you look back uh, at the last 100 years, there's always been an intimate relationship between uh, security and technological developments. You know, people understood very clearly you need technology to develop new weapons, etc., etc. What we need now is an intimate relationship between security and science on climate. We are not there yet. We need to get the science needs to be part of our security development. And if we get that right, then the response in security terms will be much faster and much more concrete and will actually deliver results. So I would like to have the same nexus you have between technology and defense and security. I would like to see that between the science communities and uh, defense and security. Okay, so you two need to get on the train to Paris because the Climate Finance Summit is where the money which is needed to make all of this happen um, and particularly to uh, bring human security to the Global South uh, will be discussed and looking forward to your contributions there. Um, thank you all very much. Fantastic to have such a lineup, and thank you very much for your provocative questions. conversation. Thanks to all of you who have joined us today. Uh, and let me also say that uh, this is hardly the last one that GMF is going to do. Uh, we take this issue very, very seriously. It's very closely connected uh, to the work on geostrategy, the work we do on innovation. Uh, you'll see more on this front. We hope you'll join us. Um, let me also maybe say a word of thanks to my colleagues, our team.